But as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Christ Jesus, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but is yes in whom? If you remove the preposition I in from Paul's writings, you would not be able to understand anything he says. The preposition I in is also speaking of origin, where something begins. I threw out the suggestion last week for anyone that wants to read Ephesians chapter 1 through. 14, to count how many times the preposition I am is used by the Apostle Paul. In him, in the beloved. But is yes in him. Verse 20. For as many as may be the promises of God, here we go again, in him they are yes. Wherefore also by him or in him is our amen to the glory of God through us. 21. Now he who establishes us with you, here we go, in Christ and anointed us is God, who also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. Whose pledge? His pledge. God's pledge. Are God's pledges, can you count them? Yes. Yeah. Well, if we don't, we're in trouble, because I don't know who else you could count on. So the word established means that God accomplished something in who? Christ. In Christ. And now, God is looking for a generation of people that say what? Everything I say, think, say, and do is going to be where? In who? Christ. Christ. Sorry about that. <laughs> All of the miracles that God performed in bringing Israel out of the bondage of Egypt was to demonstrate to them and hopefully to us God's power to deliver us from the bondage of sin. Remember what we said in Galatians 3.22? But the scripture has concluded all things under the sin issue. That they which be of faith can be blessed as he blessed faithful Abraham. Galatians 3, 8 and 9. So I flipped over from 3, 22 to 3, 3, 8 and 9. So when God brought Israel to Mount Sinai, he simply reminded them of what he had done for them for how long? Two years, one month, and one day. Number one, one. What did he do for them for two years, one month, and one day? Well, during the daytime, what did he provide for them? Over them. Wow. Clouds to protect them from the desert sun. At night, what did he do for them? Fire. During the daytime, when they were thirsty, what did he provide for them? Where there was no drinkable water and everybody knew it. What else did he provide for them? Food trying to convince them, since they had been slaves for 430 years, convince them with empirical evidence that he was in charge and he had something very special that he wanted to accomplish for them and through them. So the covenant that God made with Israel was referring to which covenant? The covenant that God audibilized to Israel at Mount Sinai was referring to which covenant? Yeah, 
his covenant with Abraham. In Genesis 12, verses 2 and 3, and then in Genesis 15, verse 6. There, there, there's only one covenant. The old covenant was invented by the Israelites at Mount Sinai when they said, what? That's the invention of the old covenant. And whenever we make promises to God, what are we doing? We're entering into bondage by our own choice. And God says, what did Paul say in verse 21? Please explain to me why do you prefer to live in the bondage after what I have preached to you? Please explain it to me. As the possessor of all the earth, God was now ready to deliver on his promise to whom? Abraham. What was God asking Israel to contribute in this unilateral covenant? Let's read it. Let's go to Exodus 19. Verses 5 and 6. Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6. In fact, let's read verse 4 before 5. When you get there, say, ready? Ready. Who would like to volunteer to read Exodus 19, 4, 5, and 6? Carl, please. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Thank you. If you will hear my voice. Your Bible say O B E Y. That's unfortunate because we associate the word O B E Y with us doing something. But in the Old Testament original language, Hebrew, it means if you will submit, if you will subordinate your will to me. Also, you can say, if you will listen attentively, I'm going to produce activity in you like you've never imagined in your life. Does the gospel produce inactivity? No. Apathy? No. The reason I ask that is because people say, yeah, but we have to believe. <laughs> what? No, if you sit there and listen attentively to what God is trying to communicate to you, it is impossible for you to sit there and do nothing. Inside, you're saying, wow, this is incredible. I've never heard anything like this. And who's promising it? God, the creator of the universe. And you just start moving inside of yourself. Wow. When I understood this, that's what happened to me internally. And I couldn't believe the number of ideas that God started popping into my head of things that I can do and quit doing. <clears throat> Not a fear of punish, punishment or hope of reward, but because I was excited about understanding, not knowing, I knew a lot of stuff, but I did not understand what God has, had been trying to communicate to me. And every time I open this book, I get a new insight into something that I may have read a dozen times before. That's the Holy Spirit bringing me what? From the level that I was at, which was pretty low, to a different level of understanding. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. So that's what the word listen means. Obey, submit, subordinate. And the word K-E-E-P means guard, protect. I've given you something very, very special. What did God say to Adam and Eve? I want for you to what? Tend the garden. But I also want for you to what? Keep it. Keep it. What does keep mean? Guard, protect, appreciate. 
Guard from what? Everything was perfect in the Garden of Eden. Why is he telling them to keep it? And what's the definition of the word keep? Guard, protect. I'm going to say something very important to you. I want for you to cherish it. What was he preparing them for? That tree that he planted in the middle of the garden. Which he said to them, don't even get close to it. Isn't it wonderful how God always prepares us before he knows we're going to be what? Face, face to face with Satan and his temptations. He always prepares us. Amazing. Oh, here. The, the word also means to treasure. Yes. And to cherish. Yes. Yes. All of those things. That's yes. Key. Yes. Who would like to read Romans 4.13? Romans 4.13, which piggybacks with what we're talking about here right now. Romans 4.13. We've read Romans 4, 11, and 12. I don't think I have. I don't remember. Okay, Mary Jane, Romans 4, 13. Everybody there? Hang on, hang on. Let's, I, see, I hear some leaves turning. Okay, go. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. That's it, folks. What does the word righteousness mean? Right living. Right living. Right. Last night, it was my privilege and pleasure to meet with two individuals that are here this morning, and they wanted to study one word. That word was righteousness. And we spent one hour and 15 minutes studying one word. How boring is that? <laughs> so we began by the illustration that our speaker two sides ago used. He used a bench up here and he propped it up here sideways. And the reason he did that is to show you the background of the word R-I-G-H-T. That's where the word righteousness comes from. Straightening something out that is not right. It comes from the old English of 1611. Translation of the King James Version. So Jesus came to what? Write something that was what? Not right. That's the background of the word right. Or righteousness. Why was that necessary? Because God's law is holy. And Adam and Eve decided to become self-dependent instead of God-dependent. Now God has to find a solution to this situation. So, 4,000 years after they chose to disobey, Jesus shows up to invent righteousness in laboratory earth. And that's what the word righteousness means. It means someone has come in contact with sin in fallen human nature and triumphed over it. It is the only application for the word righteousness. There is no other. Before Adam and Eve sinned, they're not even called righteous. The unfallen angels that did not rebel against God in heaven, they're never called righteous. The only application for the word righteous is what I just shared with you. Someone has come in contact with sin in fallen human nature and triumphed over it. The only way he could have done that is by identifying with me and my nature at the incarnation. So what he did for me, me being here in this case the human race, for what he did in his body, wasn't a body made for him? Through a sinful woman, Hebrews 10, 5. And that's why in Romans 8, 3, he says, he crucified the flesh. Whose flesh? His flesh. How can he crucify something that he didn't have in himself to crucify, folks? This is the master deception of Satan. 
that Jesus did not identify with us at the Incarnation. Because had he identified with us, they teach, he would have needed a Savior. They're teaching what the largest Christian denomination on the planet teaches. Original sin. Romans 5.12. <laughs> that sin is so pervasive that had Jesus taken on our nature, he would have needed a Savior. That's the concept of original sin. But the scripture has overwhelming evidence that Jesus did identify with us. How else could he say to us in Revelation 3.21, Chuck, I want for you to overcome the way I did. What? You're asking me to do something with equipment different than yours when you were here? That would make Jesus the biggest hypocrite that ever walked in the earth. If he asked me to do something that he did, but with different equipment than I am. Just chew on that for a while. So faith does what? It justifies. What else? It makes us righteous. Faith also makes it possible for us to experience what? The Ten Commandments. We do not gain eternal life by keeping the law. What did Jesus say in John 5, 24? Who wants to look that up for us? John 5, 24. Volunteer to read John 5, 24. We're going to find out how we get eternal life right here, right now. Don't you want to go in? How many of you want to be in heaven someday? We're going to find out right now how to get there. Mary Jane? Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. You like that? Faith also makes commandment keeping a reality. So when Paul speaks of Hagar and Sarai, he's saying, these two women are two covenants. Verse 24 from Galatians 4. Do these two covenants exist today? These two covenants have nothing to do with time. In the Christian world, the covenants are taught as dispensations, periods of time. The dispensation of the old covenant is being taught as from the time man sinned to the cross. The second dispensation is from the time of the cross to the end of time. The old covenant, unfortunately, is alive and well. The two covenants are dealing with two spiritual conditions. Those two spiritual conditions is the difference between the woman that's in bondage and the free woman. The covenant that Israel made with God at Sinai, all that the Lord has said, has said we will do, also known as the works of the law, continues to hold most Christians in bondage today. The covenant from above gives us freedom. Not freedom from obedience of the law, but freedom from <laughs> disobedience to the law. Amen. Do we get that? Yes. Because some people are trying to do away with the law. The freedom is not found away from the law, but in the law. Let's read it. Who would like to turn to Psalms 119? Psalms 119, the longest psalms of all the psalms. Psalms 119. Volunteer. Volunteer. 119, verse 1 and 45. 1 and 45. I still hear leaves change turning. Let's wait. Diana. 
Psalms 119, verses 1 and 45. Let's go. Blessed are the undefiled in the way, who walk in the law of the Lord. That's 1, and verse 45. And I will walk at liberty, for I seek your precepts. So, walking in the law gives us what? Liberty. How? Through the Holy Spirit. Because if we try to do it on our own, it condemns us. Do we understand that? Any questions on that? Uh, just a little history here. The, the 1888 message that came to us as a people was all of this. We preached the law as an antinomians came in with this dispensationalism and said the law was done away with. But we showed the Sabbath was the seventh day and we debated people. And Ellen White wrote this in 1895 to uh, O.A. Olson. She says, the Lord in his great mercy sent the most precious message to elders Wagner and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith and surety, invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. That's the work of God. It doesn't do away with the law. It causes us to obey the law. Thank you. Thank you. So, one covenant deals with what we can do. The other covenant deals with what the Spirit of God can do. Again, nowhere in the letter to the Galatians does Paul deal with the issue as to whether or not the law should be kept. The only question is how should it be kept? It is our doing and the reward comes by nullifying grace and becomes death or is it God working in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure? Amen. Yeah. Philippians 2.13 The covenant that I've studied today is not only about two covenants but about two cities. Jerusalem today is in bondage. She symbolically represents the old covenant, Mount Sinai. Unfortunately, most people are building their relationship with God based on the promises that the people at Sinai made to God. So let's take a look at a long passage, and we're going to read half of the passage, thought. We're going to read two verses, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and I want to volunteer to only read verses 14 and 15. Later on, we're going to read verses 16 through 18. But right now, I need a volunteer to read verses 14 and 15 of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Linda. But their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains, unlifted in reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies in their heart. Okay. From what else does the New Covenant give us freedom? From the law. Why did he say it? Freedom from the law? Remember Romans 6, 14? You who are under grace are no longer under what? Huh? The law. Yeah. Who would like to read quickly? Romans 8, 2. Romans 8, 2. Over here, Regina. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Isn't that beautiful? The law of what? In. There's that preposition again, folks. Everything is in Christ. It's either in Christ or outside of Christ. That's you and my choice. Now, let's read the second half of 2 Corinthians 3, chapter 3, 
volunteer for, to read 16 and 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16, 17, and 18. Now we'll let. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we read 14 and 15, now we want to, to finish the thought, 16, 17, and 18. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the bed is now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Thank you. So, why does Jesus call the Holy Spirit the Parakletos, P-A-R-A, where we get the word power? Because we kicked it out in the Garden of Eden when we decided to become self-dependent instead of God-dependent. But Jesus calls it what? The Parakletos, the helper, the twerp, parallel to us. And all we have to do is what? Invite him in, and he takes over. Totally, completely takes over. At some point in our lives, we're going to have to decide. It, it, it's very easy to say, oh yeah, this is, a, this is the Word of God, and it's inspired. At some point in our lives, we're going to have to decide if we're going to surrender to this book or not. Amen. That's all we're studying here. We're studying how bondage came into the life of Israel. Was it God's will to take them to Sinai? Was that God's first option? Let's turn to Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15, and we're running out of time, so I'm going to read Exodus chapter 15, say ready when you're there, and I'll start reading. Exodus chapter 15. Do you have a heading for chapter 15? Song of Moses. Yeah. When did they begin singing the song of Moses in Israel? When God brought them across the Red Sea. Now look what he says. This is a song. Then Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord and said... I will sing to the Lord, for He is highly exalted. The horse and its rider He has hurled into the sea. Is that descriptive or not? Two, the Lord is my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise Him, my Father's God. I will extol Him. Okay, now let's flip over, jump over to verse 13. In Thy loving kindness Thou hast led the people whom Thou hast redeemed, in thy strength, thank, strength, thou hast guided them to thy holy habitation. Amen. 17. Thou will bring them and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance. The place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thy dwelling. The sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. Amen. What did Israel's enemies think of the way God brought them for two years, one month, and one day? Thank you. Let me read it to you. Verse 14 through 16. The people have heard, they tremble. Anguish has gripped the inhabitants of Philistia, Philistine. Then the, 15, then the chiefs of Edom were dismayed. The leaders of Moab, trembling, grips them. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. 16, terror and dread fall upon them. By the greatness of thine arm, they are motionless as stone. Until thy people pass over, O Lord. Until the people pass over whom thou hast purchased. That's the reaction of the enemies of Israel as God brings them from two years, one month, and one day to where? Well, where did God want to set bring them? That's the question. Where did God want to bring them? Let's read it. Let's read it. Oh. Isaiah. Isaiah 35, 10. Volunteer for Isaiah 35, 10 and a volunteer for Isaiah... 51. Volunteer for Isaiah 35.10. Mary Jane, thank you. For 35.10? Yes. And a volunteer for 51.10 and 11. Volunteer. Okay, Tom. Here we go. 
And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. With everlasting joy on their heads, they shall obtain joy and gladness, and the sorrow and sign, sighing shall flee away. Thank you. Tom, go. 10 and 11. What's that? Isaiah 51, verse 10 and 11. 